are Kyle, the VP of Channel at Cobaton, and Elise, the VP of Product at Functionize, and they are presenting the four core problems of test automation. Great, thank you, Carla. So uh, Kyle and I are going to tag team a little bit here, so you'll get to hear from both of us, and I do encourage you to ask us all the questions that you may have. We love answering questions. Um, so I'll just go ahead and introduce myself first. So my name is Elise Carmichael. Um, and uh, like Carla said, I'm the VP of product at Functionize. I've been here at Functionize for about six or seven months since the beginning of the year. Um, and prior to that, I worked at a company called Tricentis, which also merged with a company called QA Symphony that I worked at. And Kyle and I actually worked together at that company. And you on the call may have heard of it. It's another company in the testing space. And presumably you're all here because Functionize and Cobitan are also in the testing space and in some fashion you were interested in us. Um, but prior, what I did at Tricentis, I ran a product strategy. And prior to that, I was an engineer and tester, engineering director, and have uh, you know, a very technical background. So I love to get all the technical questions. If you have any questions later on about you know, product X versus product Y, I'm happy to get into the weeds with you as time permits. Kyle? Awesome. Well, thanks, Elise. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. This is Kyle McMeekin here. On the VP of Channel Alliances over at Cobaton. Um, as Elise alluded to, we had the pleasure of working together for several years at previous companies. So I uh, initially was starting off as a sales engineer for QA Symphony and then moved more into managing the cloud alliances for Tricentis for a few years before making the jump to Cobaton in December. So similar to Elise, uh, very familiar with the testing space uh, from functional automation tools to performance and load testing offerings um, and everything in between. So excited for you all to join us today where we can kind of start diving into what we've noticed over the years as far as it relates to challenges with automation. And we uh, look forward to the discussion and getting some questions from everyone at the end. So shall we, Elise, you want to go ahead and kick things off? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, this webinar is about, uh, you know, looking at some of the major problems that still exist in test automation, even today, um, how a lot of that hasn't really changed over the years. Um, and also to talk about kind of the, the market, what's out there right now, what problems are solved, what aren't solved. Um, and Kyle and I will be very, very honest with you. Uh, but before we kind of get into some of that, we wanted to start and kind of take a step back and look at why you're doing test automation in the first place and what you are automating. And the reason you know, we want to do this is to sort of level set, so to speak. You know, if, if you're automating just because you don't have enough people to, to manage your work, or if you're automating just to get your releases faster, you know, what's important to you. And so I think it's always really important to step back and make sure you're doing the right thing. And then what you're testing also affects the approach that you're going to take. If you are only ever testing a native mobile application that's your only focus you're going to look at a completely different set of tools and if you are interested in integration testing or web and api testing so this is something we want to make sure that you are thinking about and then the other thing we wanted to address here are because kyle and i have been in this industry for so long we wanted to kind of bring up some of the pitfalls that we have seen so we've seen a lot of companies fail um, a lot of them succeed and there's kind of two approaches you can take early on and we, we've certainly seen a lot of them so like what i would consider over engineering so this is the the digital transformation approach where you have top down everyone is using tool X or tool Y, or they're all using this one framework. And they try to do this one size fits all. And sometimes that works. And a lot of times it doesn't work and you get disgruntled team members. And the problem is like somebody did not research enough what is going to make their team successful for what they're testing and why they're testing it. And then on the other side, you have under planning. So this is usually, this is actually a very common scenario where uh, someone in the testing organization says, hey, I can automate this and they start automating it and it's cool and they have great results, but it doesn't necessarily fit what needs to happen in the, the bigger organization. So instead of sort of researching after the fact, they just try to grow it and then it becomes kind of unmanageable or something fails in one way or another. Not always. So the the point that I want to make here is to just do all the research and we're hoping that, you know, with this webinar, we can help at least point you in the right direction or you can ask questions and we'll help point you in the right direction 
Yeah. And I think one of the things that, you know, I've seen over the years is not really having a clear understanding to the, some of the initial questions around why you're automating things to begin with. Um, oftentimes, I think that causes teams and organizations to perhaps adopt a tool, a framework, or a methodology just to kind of keep up with the Joneses, so to say, but not necessarily understand how that testing is going to evolve over time. So we'll talk a little bit about how um, unforeseen kind of complexities tend to arise where you might start just automating, let's say, a, a web-based app, but that soon extends into automating full end-to-end -end flow. So trying to have a you know, a concise but also longer term view of how you're expecting your automation journeys to evolve should be helpful as it comes uh, to picking tooling to help fulfill and push towards some of those internal goals. Okay, um, so with that said, uh, briefly wanted to share a quick study from McKinsey and Company. This was actually released in August of last year. Um, it was predominantly focused around, you know, the push to cloud and the multi-cloud approach, but there are some really good insights in this and it's linked in the bottom if you're curious to check it out um, as it related to just general tooling and the push to become more automated. Um, so obviously applicable to testing and then broader areas of automation within the business as well. And one of the key things that I noticed and Elise and I were talking about is this whole notion of um, having actually a real trade-off between choosing a single set of tool, um, a single solution to do everything versus actually looking at tools um, that are going to help and be best suited for each environment. Um, so later on in the talk, we're gonna kind of talk about, well, if I'm, if I'm looking to automate you know, ERP systems or database flows, I'm likely choosing a different uh, product for that than I would be if I was looking to automate a mobile application, or if I was responsible for validating the end-to-end -end flow between a mobile check deposit, right, through a banking app, those tools and technologies are vastly different um, internally for the company, and, and hence a lot of CIOs see that being able to select something that's ultimately going to make the most sense for the team, for the scenario they're looking to automate, is much more impactful than just going with a single vendor and um, trying to do everything under the sun with one technology. So um, in addition to that, another um, pretty cool fact from that same survey was the talent gap, which I don't think was really surprising um, and likely isn't surprising to anyone. But I think often what we hear and see is expecting a tool to fit and fulfill um, technical knowledge, right? Uh, whether it is a highly technical product or if it's a kind of a lower code approach to doing automation, a tool doesn't solve issues. Uh, we actually got a really interesting comment on, um, or we saw a really interesting comment around, there has to be ongoing um, processes and trainings and enablement for employees and resources that are tasked with doing a lot of this automation to help make making this a success in the long run. It's not something that's simply um, purchased, thrown on the shelf, and then expecting to achieve these um, you know, extraordinary results, which a lot of groups are striving to hit um, on their automation journey. So again, yeah, this is this is really interesting. I, I'm surprised the talent gaps is so high because there's so many, you know, reports and studies saying, oh, we're going to replace all of our testers with just having engineers. I really don't, I don't see that happening because I don't think there's enough people with that skill set. So this kind of backs that up a little bit. Yep. Awesome. So this is one of my favorite slides um, because it's so applicable to so many things, but especially testing, you know, you you add one little feature and you think, okay, it's just one little new thing to test, but it's actually it becomes exponential extremely fast because you have to, you know, test all of these different flows through your application. And just because you started out with one method, maybe you can do some Selenium tests for your one application does not mean that as your company grows, as that product grows, as it becomes more integrated with other tools, that is the thing that is going to last you. Or if you select a, a certain kind of company um, with a product, maybe that's not going to last you. So this is just another thing of just make sure you think about, it's not you know one month down the road, it might be one year, how, how much time do you invest in what you're doing now before you start researching all of your options and you know, you have to be okay throwing away what you're doing. I, I tell this to when when I was running uh, development teams, I always told them, you know, in the first couple of weeks, I'd maybe help 
if we were doing a training program, give them some assignment that they'd immediately have to throw out. And just the disappointment on their face was was so sad. But I'm like, but in the real world, you have to do this all the time. So, you know, don't get too attached to what you're doing because it might not be the long term best solution or even the medium term best solution. Right. And I think this is a, I mean, probably everybody on the webinar can relate to this in some capacity with what they've seen day to day is at their company or at their company over the years, right? New technologies are gonna emerge. There's gonna be additional technologies that you have to support. Um, I don't think anyone, you know, 20, 30 years ago could fathom, you know, the importance of smartphones and how much uh, testing and all that goes into uh, mobile, right? Given that how those have really grown in popularity over the years from applications and, you know, mobile banking, all of those type of things that nobody would have envisioned um, are things that, you know, to Elisa's point, you've got to be comfortable kind of moving along and adopting or adapting, I should say, to account for these these new complexities that are, are going to come up. Absolutely. Cool. All right. So with that, let's um, kind of setting the stage, right, really thinking through the why and how and uh, having a firm understanding of potential complexities that are going to arise in the near future. Let's hone it in really and talk specifically around I love the, the word still in here. A lot of the same problems that groups are facing or running into as they're being tasked or as they're moving towards more and more automation from, from the lens of testing. So Elise, yeah. you want to thoughts? Yeah, I have a, a quick, quick story um, before we get started on this section. Um, so I had my first job in the engineering testing space about 20 years ago, maybe 21 now. Um, and I was basically writing what amounted to like unit tests for some hardware testing that I was doing. And at that point I was like in high school, I didn't entirely know what I was doing. Um, and then my first job out of college was also in the testing space. I worked at a blood bank and, um, was a, a test engineer and developer there. And we used a tool called rational robot, which I don't know if anyone on the call has heard of it. Um, but I, I can feel your groans, even though I can't hear you. And it was uh, a recorder kind of tool, kind of like Selenium IDE. It was super brittle. Um, and it was, you know, in, in the most negative sense, a record playback tool that only recorded exactly what you clicked on. And we had a regression test that we ran every night and you'd come in in the morning and nothing worked and it would just break in the, the worst possible ways over the smallest things. So it was, it was awful. And what I think is kind of funny and sad is that today I feel like we have the exact same problems. Our tests are brittle um, and we haven't solved this and it's 20 years later, but every other kind of um, engineering tool, engineering product, productivity tool has changed um, in the last 10 years, very, or 20 years, very, very drastically. And testers, I feel like have sort of gotten left behind. Um, so that was kind of the, the reason I wanted to address, like here are the four problems that are still, still here. Um, how is this possible? Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through these top four problems, in our opinion, and we're gonna compare uh, building a solution versus buying a solution. And because I'm a big pessimist, um, they're all uh, apparently all the cons, I'm not getting any pros. Um, so, but before we even get there, I wanna talk about what, when you build something, you know, you're usually talking about open source. Um, and I wanted to lay out that that is not a free option. Uh, they are both very, very expensive. If you are trying an open source solution for your entire testing, uh, your entire test framework and the infrastructure, there's a lot of costs involved. I mean, the infrastructure, which Kyle talked to, the test creation, the test maintenance, usually the maintenance is kind of the downfall of most companies because you you have the, this great big test framework you can maybe create tests pretty quickly but running them over and over again over time you're, you tend to still have to fix these things every day you come in with your regression suite even if you're you know running it on a different cadence there's just always stuff um you know reporting results does not come out of the box with open source tools and then you know do you even have the right skill set or the right capacity yep definitely so we'll we'll be sure to kind of dive into all of those and Sticking in the, within the kind of the lanes of where um, Elise and I have, ex have experience, you know, we'll be specifically focused on mobile and browser-based uh, functional test automation. Uh, obviously, there's a, not, a lot of other layers uh, from a technology standpoint and the type of testing that is going to be ongoing uh, that we could certainly speak to, but this will be focused mostly on the mobile and browser piece uh, from the functional sense. So we'll talk a lot about how 
hey, even as teams start to build out their own automation assets, whether it's through open source, whether it's through commercial, there's other um, pieces such as infrastructure that they'll have to kind of layer into that equation to really get an understanding of you know, running that automation at scale and being able uh, to have that automation serve its core need, which is of course accelerating you know, deliveries and making sure that this, those uh, product deliveries are of the highest quality. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well later on around how specifically even within mobile, um, there's just so many complexities and deviations between hardware manufacturers and providers and different operating systems and really no sort of standard uh, when it comes to automation for uh, mobile apps as there is for something with HTML, right? That, you know, might have a diff couple different rendering um, uh, differences, right? Amongst uh, different screen resolutions and reactive type of websites, but for the most part uh, with HTML5 and all that all renders really in the same way. So we'll dive into that as we jump along. So I'll call this big problem number one is test creation. Um, so when you are building your own tests and your own test framework, you have to pick the programming language. Um, if you're doing web-based testing, you're picking Selenium. Um, if you're picking Cypress, they kind of give you a programming language along with it. Um, and then you have to pick the actual test framework on top of that. And sometimes you have multiple on top of that. Um, so this is where you get into, well, do I use BBD? Um, what are the benefits of BBD? And people kind of misuse BBD. Um, I'll stop saying BBD in a second. Uh, people kind of misuse this uh, in almost every organization that I have uh, seen that tries to adopt this. And it almost never is, is a, a big success for them because they don't adopt it kind of the way it was intended. But you might be using, most people use a unit test framework, for example, like a JUnit or TestNG on top of their programming language and on top of Selenium. So you have to learn all of these things. And then the question is, why are we still using unit test frameworks for this? And it's by far the most popular thing still. And this is one of those things that this is a very, very old technology stack. Why haven't we improved this? Um, skill sets as a whole, you know, it's a, a pretty clear, uh, if you have the skill set, your organization, you can certainly learn a lot of this. Um, you have to treat this like an engineering team. So you can't just say, okay, well, this, this guy or girl is gonna go build an automation framework and that's that. It, you have to treat it like a team. You have to have, uh, you know, your code repository if you use Git or whatever. You have to, have, you know, code review each other's code because then you're just as likely to introduce bugs in the test framework as you are in the software itself. Um, and then obviously onboarding. But if you're buying something, you have to learn that company's, you know, specific tool. Sometimes there's code involved still. Um, sometimes they don't, you know, cover whatever you want to cover. If you want to do some sort of specific kind of uh, I don't know, if you want to generate a specific kind of variable or something, maybe that tool doesn't even support it. Um, obviously, it's going to cost uh, money up front, unlike bootstrapping something. And then, um, you know, upgrading and maintenance of the product, you could break things accidentally when you do an upgrade. And so that's kind of a, a can of worms that is less known maybe than building. I told you I was a, a pessimist. These are all negatives. But you're a fair pessimist if they're all I'm a fair <laughs> I, and least... I'm not even yeah i'm not advocating one is better than the other you know i i'm a developer at heart i'd probably lean towards building something despite the fact that i work at a company that helps you build automation um so, so test maintenance number two biggest problem um i i would argue that this is actually the biggest problem um that companies fail at, you know, they, they think creation, once I got it created, I'm good. But the problem is uh, almost every single kind of test framework that you use, tool or other, like a, a product that you buy or otherwise use something called selector. So this is, I'm gonna allude to a web page, but it's, it's the same for desktop and mobile, usually it just works a little differently. But you say, okay, well, this is the third div on the page, or this is, I'm looking for the button with a certain ID. That's how most things work. Every single um, framework I've seen someone build at a specific company uses a selector. And they may use a great design pattern like the page object design pattern where you're only defining these selectors once per element, but it's still incredibly brittle. Developers change things all the time. Sometimes the, select, you know, the page moves around just slightly or sometimes you're looking at something that's looking at content that someone is dynamically adding and they can break things. 
So there's all, all kinds of stuff that goes wrong during the when you're building it yourself. Um, debugging it can be tricky. There are lots of bugs in Selenium. There are even more bugs in Appium. Um, so are you going? Are you ready to commit to an open source framework, or are you comfortable with updating that? And then, of course, if you're building yourself, you don't have the support of a company to say, hey, this is broken, please fix it for me. If you're buying something, uh, <laughs> the biggest thing I would say here is most companies are pretty bad at test maintenance. Uh, they still use Selenium behind the scenes or they still use um, a, a brittle method behind the scenes. So this, you know, you have to test out on whatever you're going to be automating to see if it's too brittle for your site. Um, and this sometimes takes a little time to, to try it out. So I will say uh, websites have particularly complex stuff in it uh, very, very frequently, something like lazy loading, like it dynamically loads content when you scroll down the page. Almost no tool that I've encountered can handle this. And so you get kind of stuck if this is like a big part of your application, like a like a news website or like a Netflix or something. Cool. Well, yeah, then within the test infrastructure and how do you kind of take the automation that you create and run it? Um, so this would be actually having access to different sort of phones, browsers, emulators, different types of devices that actually are going to run uh, those assets that you generate. So from a build standpoint, I think initially and in maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago, this would be really challenging to kind of do, um, right? I, and we'll talk about this later on, but um, overall, you know, as Elise was referring to, there's a lot of cost to kind of run um, the test, right? Are you going to have just VMs or not even VMs, actual machines just in your office on a network that are running and installed with different browsers? How do you kind of manage that? Um, are you going to set up an actual, you know, lab on site with a bunch of wires and different phones that are plugged into those so people can do testing, you know, on mobile? Um, it just becomes very difficult to kind of do that um, if you're looking to build out these kind of hubs or um, infrastructure areas within your organization to run those tests. Um, outside of that, there's whole other complexities around security and how you make those um, you know, respective devices or servers accessible. Um, and then from a buying standpoint, right, making sure that, hey, if you are going to a vendor to say, look, we need you guys to do X for us. We need to support this many phones. We need to support this many browsers. Um, you know, those, those uh, companies, you know, better have top-notch security. They're going to have access to those scripts or at least going to be running them on their infrastructure. So having a secure way that you can stand that up um, is definitely something that a lot of groups that, um, you know, we've, we've heard and spoken to have really top of mind, um, but also something that some of the early players in the space, you know, Perfecto, Sauce Labs, those type of groups, did a nice job of solving. Um, so we'll talk later on kind of how we've seen this area evolve to kind of support um, the buy option or even with AWS um, being able to spin up or Azure, any of the cloud providers, VMs, um, even companies building this themselves to support some of the browser use cases. So hopefully not as pessimistic as Elise, but I will leave that. <laughs> I'll well, it's, it's been fun watching the uh, the infrastructure change over time. I worked at a, a company called Mobiquity previously, which was a, a professional services company in the mobile space. And when I started working out there, you know, there was Sauce Labs. Um, I think I, I had met, Kobe Tan wasn't a thing, but it became a thing while I was working there. It was very exciting to, to see something that was exactly what I wanted start to appear in the market. So it's it's been very cool watching this. Uh, grow. So if this is not something you've used yet, this is definitely a thing you should know that exists and know that it's constantly getting better. I think AWS didn't even have theirs, but um, they have a, a decent uh, device farm and they used to just be emulated and maybe they have a few other options now, but everyone's got their own problem. So I won't go into that. <laughs> right. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about this later on as well in terms of trying to bridge, right, the assets you create with the infrastructure that you run it on and talk about some of uh, the challenges we've seen there. Absolutely. So the last thing I want to mention is the, the problem in, in the analysis. In When you build something, you have to build this. Um, there, there is no analysis. You get the most, most uh, bare minimum kind of reporting like this pass has failed. Um, when you buy a tool, I'm going to argue and say most tools are terrible at the analysis piece also. 
this is actually something that our company is looking to solve to not just give you a pass fail number, but to tell you, you know, what's going on, or here's some trends that you need to look at, or this browser keeps failing in this area, or, uh, you know, the performance is starting to slow down, you should probably look at that. So more, more on the analysis because of our, our um, uh, the, the data science piece of how our company works, which I'll talk about in just a second. But before we do that, we actually have an interactive poll for you all um, so that we're not just talking at you without any feedback. All right. So what is your biggest problem with test automation today? Um, so in, in relation to the four things we just talked about, creation, maintenance, infrastructure, or scaling, and we forgot analysis, um, but I will assume that's a problem for everyone. I'm excited to see. Me too. What's your guess? I mean, I'm going maintenance. I'm going to go analysis since it's 100% 100, 100 of all. <laughs> all right, you win, you win. I know scaling's tricky too, to, to run everything in parallel. But at that point, you might be pulling down your, uh, your test environment. I see that happen quite frequently, you know, once we fix kind of the infrastructure problem of actually performing the test, then you get this problem of my test environment is not like production, what do I do? Um, a couple ways you can look at that. Oh, oh, Eight. I am the big winner. Wow. There other than other than the, uh, the uh, you know, analysis not being there. I'll just analysis. assume everyone wants better analysis. So I wanted to bring up, um, okay, we have these problems. There's a bunch of tools out there. We're not just gonna talk about how amazing our products are. Um, I, I like to think that we're, we're fair. I will tell you all the bad things about our product um, as well, if you ask me. Um, but I wanna talk about some of the, the changes that have been made in more recent times and ways that the modern tools are a little bit different than maybe some of the legacy tools. So first off, I consider testing a complete data science problem. There's so much data available and most companies are trying to go in this direction where they want to have this really modern tool that's AI and ML, but most of them are not doing that. Um, and most companies that are doing testing, almost all of them are still running manual tests. Maybe not all of them, maybe about half are, are still running a lot of manual tests. Um, or they have automated tests and most of those tests are failing. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have encountered a, a new company and I would never tell you the names of them, but like really large companies, you've definitely heard of them, maybe like stake a, a good amount of your life in somehow, um, who have so much manual testing or so many half uh, or like incomplete automation scripts where most of them don't even work, or maybe they used a legacy tool like a, like a UFT and they're like, yeah, well, you know, 500 tests run, but they have 20,000 in there. So you go, well, how, what are those other 20,000s? So this is like a, a shockingly bad problem. Yeah. And I think at least like what you see though, if, if you're not answering some of those initial questions around why and what type of processes and flows you're looking to automate, then you kind of end up with a high number of tests perhaps, but you're, it doesn't do much, right? I mean, outside of jumping up and down and saying, Hey, look, we've got a couple thousand automated tests. That's great. But if they're not really critical to, the application, if they're redundant, if they're very trivial, well, what is that really adding up to, right? So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, we've seen that as well, kind of both sides of that spectrum where, you know, people want to move away from manual and they just automate to automate and they don't have a very clear understanding of, of why they're doing this, what benefit it's going to get, what pains exactly. they're looking all those type of things, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Not having a good approach is, you know, you're, you're going to have a bad time no matter what. So what I argue, if you click one more time, um, that there's so much data that you can collect when you run the test, when you create the test, um, that you should, you know, that we, we can run all these machine learning algorithms just to make sense of that data. That's kind of the point of these algorithms. I have so much data. How can I classify it? How can I do something useful with it? And so what you'll see in like the modern tools is trying to go into this direction where I want to collect a lot of data now do something helpful for me in the testing space. So from my perspective for the test maintenance, which I'm really happy you all agreed with me that uh, that's maybe the biggest problem other than analysis because we don't know. Um, 
you, you want your test to just work over time. You make a trivial change to the application. It's clearly still doing the same thing. It's clearly not a bug. How can I just keep my tests running long term? Um, and maybe I created it, you know, I'll give you an example of maybe I had a menu at the top of my screen, like a, uh, like a navigation kind of menu. Maybe one day I decided to change those elements from anchors into buttons and I put them in like a left panel. Um, how can I not have to rewrite all my tests or how, how do I not have to like update all of the selectors for anything that was dependent on that layout? Why can't it just work? It's next to the same element. It links to the same place. There's so much that is identical about it. Um, so my belief is that things like that and obvious things should just work. So with all of this data, you know, this is something that functionize, you know, this is our, our core value proposition is like, we keep your test running. We gather, you know, thousands and thousands of pieces of data, not just from every web page, but every time you do anything like a click or a verify or whatever, we actually look at the entire page and the current state of it. We look at relative positions and the, you know, what, what its sibling is. We look at how long something took to load. We look at the network that happened. You know, if you're making API calls, maybe you need to wait on something. We look at things like send them. So if you have send versus submit, we still know that's probably the same thing that you meant. We will give you a warning, but this stuff like should not have to break your test in like modern tools. Um, so this, I strongly believe this and I'm kind of excited about where the industry is going. So I feel like some of the problems that these modern companies, not just ours are trying to solve are the ones that have been plaguing us for many, many years. All right, and as mentioned, we'll, you know, from a infrastructure standpoint, we're gonna peel this back in detail um, in a bit, but essentially how are you gonna then take those tests? And it's really this catch 22 that I see a lot of teams coming um, and chatting to us about. And and oddly enough, I was actually on the opposite side of the prob problem for many years where ultimately groups build out a lot of automation, right? And suddenly the tests that they're looking to run overnight through their CI processes or through some of those uh, solutions like Jenkins and Azure Pipeline and others are taking way longer than I expect because they're unable to run those tests um, you know, in parallel across different devices, across different browsers um, based on the requirements that they've got to fulfill. So not only is generating and maintaining those automation assets one part of the equation, but having a very fluid way to scale out and run those uh, scripts effectively is really the second part that we'd wanna dive into. And we'll talk um, here momentarily about how we've seen some companies uh, leverage new things like Docker and some of the capabilities with the cloud providers to spin up environments where they're able to essentially run these tests and then tear down those VMs, uh, which ultimately give them the flexibility to um, you know, scale out the, the whole infrastructure side of the equation, which it's definitely not a situation we would want teams to find themselves in where they make a lot of investment from a money and time standpoint into building automation and then are left at the end of the day saying, well, hmm, where am I gonna actually run you know, these, these assets? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, with that baseline there, what do we kind of view as the different product categories today, right? There's a lot out there and I'll, I'll throw a caveat up right off the bat that this isn't to say that, hey, open source is better than next gen, which is better than API. Uh, you know, There's no sort of ranking to these. Again, we're in the firm stance that certain tools are really going to excel at automating certain things, right? Different technologies, different flows, different uh, completions of full end-to-end um, -end type scenarios. There's a kind of a tool in each of those that would make sense, right? But again, relaying back to uh, the core points that we are outlining in the beginning of the presentation, you've really got to understand what you're trying to automate against, what technologies you're not only automating against today, but where those are going to head, and then pick the solution in some of these buckets that makes the most sense um, for your company, for your team, and hopefully that the um, management um, has you know, an understanding of. At least anything Absolutely. you want to cut. Yeah, I wanted to touch on a, a couple of these things because I think some are maybe not commonly known about, um, or you know, maybe we don't always break it up into these categories. And so this is something maybe we're introducing. So I want to just do a quick overview. 
Um, open source freeware, I think everyone's uh, on board with free software, could be Selenium, could be Appium, could be Java. Um, legacy automation, we mean the primarily the tools that focus on desktop uh, testing, uh, mainframe testing, uh, kind of the stuff you used 10 years ago, maybe. Um, and yeah, you probably know what I mean there. Next gen, we're looking at web-based solutions, SaaS solutions uh, that are focused more on web technologies that you're testing, APIs, mobile testing. So kind of the stuff, if you're gonna rewrite an application right now, what you would be testing. Um, so that's the, kind of the next gen category. And there's a big emphasis here on AI and automation in general. So if you're uh, doing infrastructure work, you know, automating that infrastructure setup, there's no one behind the scenes manually setting up a, a new environment. API testing, I think is uh, straightforward. This is actually pretty interesting. There's kind of a clear um, winner in, a, in the API testing space. And it's the only one of these that I think is like, this is probably the tool you're going to use. And I say clear winner, I think there's two, and that's gonna be Postman and SOAP UI. You know, if you're doing API testing, you're probably pretty familiar with those two. Um, but that's probably the only category that's like that. Infrastructure, we're looking at tools like Kobiton or Sauce Labs or Browser Stack. And then crowdsourcing, there's a couple of companies in this space. So if you want to quote unquote automate testing and you can send you know, your pile of tests to a group of people, um, to test really quickly for you. Uh, you're looking at Rainforest QA or um, Applause. So those are kind of the two big ones in that space. There might be others, but I'm less familiar with them. So I just wanted to do that quick overview before we dive into a couple of the details. And we are just gonna focus on, in this case, next gen open source and um, uh, infrastructure tooling. But please ask questions about any of them. Cool. Um, so with that said, and that's a helpful breakdown, um, Elisa, thanks for adding that in. And if there's questions that you guys have really in any of those categories, feel free to let us know and we can talk about many of the different vendors there. Um, so what I was mentioning earlier on um, in some context I wanted to give around what we've noticed, not just from the script creation standpoint, but the infrastructure side as well as the importance to bridge the two, so you have a lot of historical players um, on kind of on the left side of that bubble that essentially tell you, hey, you go out and you bring me a test and I'll run it on my browser, I'll run it on this mobile device, um, but you're gonna be the one essentially not only generating that script, but maintaining it over time. Um, some of those groups there, you know, have ways and there's a lot of complexities here of, you know, are you talking about proprietary scripting language? Are you talking about, doing this on a browser or on a mobile phone. So there's some caveats to this, uh, but for the most parts, those groups would really be the ones um, accepting your scripts that you generate or um, and running them on their side, uh, on their infrastructure or on the right side saying, look, we'll help you build um, test, right? We'll help you generate those. We'll help you maintain them. We'll do it in a low code way. We'll do it in a pure scripting way. We'll be open source or we'll be commercial, but at the end of the day, when you need to run these, you might be able to do it locally, but I'm saying run these at scale. You're usually working back towards the left-hand side to find a vendor, or you're spinning up and doing this yourself, different browsers or emulators uh, to run those tests. So really, when we start talking about what are some of the next-gen platforms in our view doing to address this problem, um, that's something we'll talk about here momentarily as we kind of look at the, the lineage um, of different groups as it relates to kind of the infrastructure side um, over the years and right and how a lot of these groups functionize ourselves um, and even I would say like some like Perfecta are looking to make it such in a way that you're actually able to do both within one platform um, and you know still adopt a lot of the new um, scripting languages or even any of the commercial tools from the right so it's not again a spot where you would want to find yourselves in where you do a lot of initial legwork um, from an automation standpoint, but then you're kind of left in the dust with the same problem where those nightly jobs that are tasked with running those scripts or regression sets are taking forever because there's no ability to, to call upon browsers and, and different types of devices. Okay, um, so I alluded to this earlier just to give you guys some background of kind of where this Markets progress really since 2016. So I'd say Perfecto and Sauce Labs are absolutely kind of the pioneers of uh, providing a solution to allow, mostly from a browser sense, 
to let you test across different um, types of browsers, different versions of Chrome, different versions of Firefox, Edge, all that good stuff. Um, and in doing so, supporting a lot of different technologies, right? Uh, predominantly Selenium and some of the open source ones. In the early 2011, 2012 timeframe, you know, browser stack came to market. Mobile Labs was really um, an early pioneer to help uh, do kind of mobile device management um, through their mobile card offering that you could, you know, wheel into a, a bank or into a, any sort of area where there was, you know, high regulations and you needed control over mobile phone devices. Um, and this was really starting, really the start of the push towards using real phones. Um, over emulators, which is, you know, a whole nother webinar that we could do, but um, that's really where a lot of the market headed. And then the newer players kind of emerged, Kobaton being one of them, to offer really unique ways, not only just to provide devices, but also help generate, um, specifically with the lens around mobile, you know, mobile automation for native applications, um, different types of deployment models for teams that were trying to make a push towards a cloud interface, right? But also have a lot of the traditional um, on-prem type support. Um, so really emerging as kind of a mobile uh, disruptor in that space. And then I have AWS in there and that date isn't really meant to say when AWS was founded, uh, obviously, but it's more focused on the ability. And we know a lot of technology companies that I actually uh, know in the market that have products that they actually are spinning up uh, VMs, right, with all these browsers and different Chrome versions and Firefox versions on them to conduct their testing in these grids. So it's allowing them at a very cheap rate to build out an environment where they can run their Selenium test or they can run um, other types of test um, at a fraction of the cost of what they were paid, like let's say a Saw Subs or Browser Stack or someone like that to do on their behalf. Um, so it's through the ways of, and I think a lot of this is driven through what we've seen as a lot of companies adopting, you know, SDETs or software development, software development engineers and test, and some people with some scripting language to build these configuration files that allow, you know, their automation assets to again run in a virtual machine that spins up, spins down, and it's kind of at a fraction of a cost. And this is mostly done on the browser side of the house or desktop browser side of the house, but it's something that we've been noticing a lot within the customers we were talking to, as well as other technology companies in the DevOps space that have actually built some of their own solutions that leverage the same type of approach for desktop browser. Very cool. Yeah. So we want to chat a little bit at least about what from a scripting side, kind of what we're seeing within the open source arena. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like to get on my high horse just a just a little bit about open source and freeware and just say there's they're very different. There's a very important difference in open source, meaning you can actually get the code and modify it. So if you want to modify how Selenium works, Selenium's open source, you can make your own fork of the Selenium project and change it however you want to make it work with your application. I warn you, it's a very big, big project. Um, freeware is more like the free software, but you can't touch the code. So Postman falls into this category if you're using the free version of it. Um, so there's pros and cons to either. Uh, freeware tends to be more supported by, you know, with an organization backing it up. Sometimes open source uh, frameworks are backed by an organization. Sauce Labs, for example, backs uh, quite a few open source projects. Um, what you won't see is like the modern stuff here. You're not going to see AI and ML. Usually that's not given away. Um, if you want to do something you can use libraries that help you with this but you still have to write it and that's it's just kind of a, a whole other problem that m most um estets and, and whatnot won't want to spend the time on most organizations won't want to spend the time on creating that more modern framework if it were even possible i mean whole companies work on this and they kind of focus on one specific problem actually i'll mention apply tools i think maybe it's on the next slide yeah, yeah. so so Apple Tools is kind of interesting. Their their whole product, I didn't actually understand what they did until I downloaded it and tried it out. But their whole thing is is very cool. It's AI and ML. It works great if you're um, if you have like a test framework already written and you want to do cool like screenshot validations inside of your existing test framework. So it kind of sits on top of it. 
Um, and so that's like a good example of like a modern tool that's focused on AI ML. And they focused on a very specific problem, which was I want to do some visual validation and make sure my page looks right. Um, but you know, I'm, I want to work with companies that already have like a Selenium framework set up or a, you know, what, whatever kind of framework they support, tons of them. Uh, these are all cloud-based uh, applications. Most of these, maybe not most, half of them sit on top of uh, Selenium. So they use Selenium behind the scenes and maybe they introduce something kind of like a BDD or a keyword framework or some code on top that basically helps control the Selenium. The problem I have with this is there's a lot of bugs in Selenium um, and it's hard to make Selenium work reliably cross browser. And I can tell you that from personal experience, I've written, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of Selenium tests over the years. Um, and then you see other tools that just, you know, they don't work out of the box or there's bugs in Selenium. Um, and it, you're kind of stuck into that selector. So how do you choose that selector, that thing that is so brittle that Selenium tests need to find the right element? So that's kind of the hard problem. Selenium just drives the, the browser, like it makes the browser click or makes the browser, um, you know, hit the back button. So that's, that's kind of what I want to say about the, the next gen tools. These are all newer tools. Uh, Functionize and Mabel are, are similar in that we try to solve a lot of those four problems and that's the focus. So I think those two are kind of the, the furthest along in that realm um, and they, they solve the problems slightly differently. So that's just what I want to say. And if you guys have any questions who are on the call or afterwards about, you know, well, what does Testcraft do? Or what's Testem? Or um, how are you different from Mabel? I would love to talk to you about that. And I'll be, like I said, very honest. Okay. Um, so quick survey here, kind of before we wrap things up and open it up to Q&A. Um, so if within your organization, your teams, um, or perhaps if, you know, you're just joining for more knowledge, which kind of tools are you guys using today? Is it a mix of, you know, different commercial products or are you strictly leveraging open source offerings or freeware? Are you guys building your own um, test farms from a device standpoint? Um, do you have your own native framework that you've perhaps built out or layered on top of some of the open source offerings? Or are you currently um, likely doing a lot of manual testing and not using anything? So. We'll leave this open for a couple minutes, and then I think next we're heading into Q and A. Is that right, Elise? We have a, a quick checklist on um, you, you know checklist. some of, yeah some of those things that we mentioned. You should should research. We just have a short checklist to show you like don't forget. You know you need to know what you're testing while you're testing it, and um, we can run through that in short order. I'm sure. Cool. Lots on open source. Very cool. All right. Your own framework. I love Perhaps it. Perhaps where the uh, maintenance piece comes into play. Could, yeah, could be really <laughs> definitely. Definitely, why, uh, definitely a big problem with with open source frameworks. It's kind of tough to keep up with. Yep. Awesome. Yep. All right. So, so real quick, you know, these are some of the things that we mentioned before. So, what's do you have the right capacity, especially, and the right skill set? So, if you're all doing open source, can your team grow? What happens when your product gets bigger and you have many, many more regression tests you need to maintain over time or smoke suite tests or integration tests and all that. Um, your team capacity related to your skill set of, oh my gosh, what if you have to hire people? Or maybe you should look at, can I bring a tool in so I don't have to increase the capacity of the team? Maybe I don't have separate testing. Uh, maybe I don't have a separate testing team and I want the developers to do some of it, but you know, I don't want them spending time writing Selenium. Maybe a tool is right. Um, so these are just things to think about. I'm, I don't want to sway you one way or the other, other than to buy functionized and uh, could be time. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, so what what's under tests? This is really important because you this is where you want to think ahead, uh, just a hair. Like if you uh, know your application's responsive web, make sure you have something that supports that. If you don't need a desktop desktop application testing or mainframe frame testing, I encourage you to not. Uh, necessarily look at the legacy tools here if you're only doing web and mobile. Uh, there's probably more modern solutions that have focused in that area. Um, or if you're doing a, a out of the box kind of product, there might be specific tools that are great for testing that kind of product. So as an example, if you're testing like SAP, I'd probably go buy, you know, Tricentis Tosca for that because they're great at that. I would definitely not buy Coviton or Functionize for that. So that everything has its place, but if you want like a one size fits all, that's a much more difficult problem and maybe, maybe not what you want to do. 
Right. And what I think we've seen through some of the studies that we've looked at that that often complicates things, right? Because you're kind of stretching those tools to perhaps do something that they might support, but not necessarily excel in. Um, so definitely, yeah. This would be, in my opinion, one of the biggest ones that you'll need to consider, um, not just in the near term, but long term, and depending on where your, your organization's heading and what type of technologies you're looking to support, which always is an unknown, hence Elise's graph. But, um, but yeah, definitely one of the bigger ones in my view. Absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, if you want to do, um, uh, AP, if you're only doing API testing, you're, you know, you have a limited set of tools that are awesome at that. But if you want to do API with functional or with security or with load, this is super important. If you want to do, um, you know, if you're just testing a mobile application, you have some really clear solutions in mind. If you're trying to test um, like an end-to-end -end scenario where it's like web and mobile, uh, your options become, you know, more limited. Yep. And I think even if you're using best of breed type solutions in this, a lot of the vendors in this space um, and even like the communities that they work within know one another well, right? So if you're chatting with a group and you realize, hey, this isn't going to work out because I need to do API testing and you guys aren't strong at this, the people you're chatting with very likely know the other companies that do excel at that. So just ask. I mean, a lot of the times they'd be happy to make that recommendation and kind of get you uh, satisfied from a tool perspective, even if it's not their own. So that happens to us, you know, frequently depending on customer needs or expectations where we might kick them over to another technology partner that we work with or another group that we know can help satisfy kind of their, their use case and, and ask. Absolutely. Cool. The last, maybe most important thing is try out all of the products that you're looking at. Um, it's really, companies like, like ours make it really tricky to understand what each product does and what they don't do. Um, and what they do well versus what they don't do well. I think every product um, that you're going to look at says we do everything. We do everything amazing. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's obviously not true. So get the trial of it. Try it out. See if you like it. See if it works. Um, I'm going to say that's the main thing. See if the product works. It's really easy to look pretty and um, maybe look modern or look like it has all these buttons and these features. But if it doesn't work on your site and your application. Um, or if you tried on a, a number of different products at your at, at your organization, it does not work like you expect it. Just try it out really early. That's what I would recommend here. Cool. So our first question wants to know, um, so I was frankly expecting more of a sales pitch about Functionize and Kobaton. What specific advantages are there about those two tools as, it, as used in conjunction with each other? So they're, they're, uh, they're, I would consider best of breed tools, like that's how you would use our products together. Um, so Functionize really focuses on web testing and responsive web testing, mobile web testing. So um, Safari and, and Chrome for iOS and Android. And uh, I, I, Kyle, you want to give a quick overview of Kobiton, what it is and isn't? Yeah, so Kobiton is, is going to be focused on providing device lab management and mobile automation for native hybrid and web-based mobile applications. So anything that relate with mobile experience, we validate from a testing perspective with our real device farm. Awesome, yeah, Functionize doesn't do native app testing right now, uh, it's just web-based stuff. So we kind of work side by side um, and it's one of those things where it's really, I, I feel it's really hard to figure out what in the world is going on in the testing industry right now. So we wanted to kind of pull our minds together because we've worked together for so long. I think I first met you in uh, QA Symphony and QTest was my vendor, I don't know how many years ago, six years ago or something. And we've seen kind of the market change so much over the last few years. So we thought it would be great to, to sort of get together and give a overview of how things are today and aren't today. All right, and we've been spitballing kind of ideas around how we could build a, an integration between the offerings, right? If we wanted to help fill some of the um, scripting support around native mobile for Functionize, perhaps on our device farm and things of that nature. So all those are chats are in flight, um, but definitely um, more to come there. Absolutely. Great. Um, so our next question wants to know, how is Functionize different to a suite of Selenium fed to browser stack? 
Okay, so if, if you're writing a, a suite of Selenium tests, you have you know a, a test framework um, that you're using. I, I don't know what who a, a asked the question, but you're using some sort of test framework. Um, you have a programming language that you're using, and then you have to spin up your machines that you're running your tests on, and so then you're using browser stack, and you can run across different browsers as long as your test supports those different browsers differences, their subtle differences. Um, Functionize basically does the whole thing in one tool. Um, it is a like a low code, no code kind of solution where we do have a kind of recorder um, and what makes it different than like, especially like a Selenium IDE because I don't think we're anything like that, but you can kind of click through your application and it doesn't just record your selectors, it actually records the entire state of the application. And then when you actually go to run the test, we have our own, um, you know, containerized the virtual device farm, so to speak, um, in the cloud. And so we'll spin up all the test machines and run your scripts, but we're not running Selenium. Uh, we're actually running our own solution. And maybe there are pieces that are Selenium. Maybe Selenium does certain things really well and really fast. But there's a lot of things that um, that we do ourselves to natively click or natively drive the browser. But the actual, the value prop of what our product is versus like Selenium is every time you run that test, it is refiguring out what you meant when you first created the test. And that's based off of those, you know, I don't remember how many, I said 40,000 or something data points on the site that we collect at every moment in time. And when your test runs and passes, we actually recollect that data. So if something did change subtly over time, you know, your element, you know, three executions away could appear 100% different than the original one and we will learn alongside your test execution. So they're super different, but they kind of solve similar types of problems of I want to write a test and scale it in the cloud. Yep. So Selenium on steroids with no need for browser stack because you guys internally, right, at least spin up those browser exactly. based. Right. Okay. Exactly. You just have to, you have to give up a little bit of control. And I know it's hard. Like I said, I'm a developer. I would want to write it myself sometimes too. Uh, is there an alternative to Selenium uh, for brow for cross browser or device slash mobile testing? Yes, um, there are. So for web based testing, the, the only like more outside of vendors and tools like ours, the only other uh, free open source type tool is Cypress. Um, but Cypress only covers uh, Chrome. They just introduced like a beta version of, of um, Firefox. So that's another way to drive the browser. But Cypress also gives you like, they, you have to use JavaScript or TypeScript. Uh, like you have to use their framework. It's essentially Mocha, which is a JavaScript test framework. So you have to learn that whole system in addition. So they kind of force it. For, for mobile, there's certainly more options. Um, and you wouldn't even use Selenium for mobile. You would use Appium um, or a number of other options. I don't know if Kyle, you want to talk to those or I, I certainly can. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what type of mobile application you're testing, right? If you're looking to do mobile browser, you know, to Elisa's point, there's Appium, there's other um, commercial products um, like Catalan, there's a product called Test Project um, as well. If you're looking to refer more towards native um, or, hey, I'm downloading an app from the iTunes store or Google Play, doing automation within those applications is a lot more complex. Um, there are some solutions that do give you ways to do scripting on that. Kobaton actually has a way to automate mobile applications, native mobile ones in a low code uh, type of approach, and then run those tests across n number of other devices without modifying anything, which is fairly unique. That's our intelligent test automation solution. Um, that I'd be happy to share more information around. But yeah, it ultimately kind of, kind of boils down to what that mobile experience is um, from an end user standpoint. And then that usually steers the route that you'd want to go from um, choosing a framework or a commercial offering to automate that process. Awesome. I'm sorry we don't get to get to more questions. I would love if you add, uh, add me or Kyle on LinkedIn um, or send us an email. I would love to have a conversation about this.